and we're recording. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for joining our TCA webinar today. I think we have some folks just uh, signing in, so we'll give you all uh, some time. Um, I'm Elise Fujimoto, and I'm excited to facilitate this webinar today with all these wonderful people. Uh, before we get started, and as folks are signing on, I wanted to point out some just basic functionality pieces of today's webinar. You all should see um, a Q&A tab at the bottom as well as a chat um, window. Feel free to utilize that. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, feel free to utilize the Q&A. Um, if you have any uh, other types of feedback, feel free to pop that into the chat as well. Um, we also might be utilizing some polls today, so I wanted to make you all aware of that. Um, and we have a lot to get through actually, so I'm gonna get started with our presentation. Let me find my slides. And let me share my so. So again, welcome to all of you who are joining us today from all over the globe. Uh, thanks for spending your Wednesday evenings with us here at TCA. Uh, today we're going to do a webinar on different options for streaming services. Um, and I'm Elise Fujimoto, your facilitator. Uh, today we have speakers Michelle Fuji, Sarah Gilbert, Yuri Kanemaru, Man Man Moi, Amy Naylor, Derek Oye, Ben Pachter, and Paul Sakamoto who are going to go through their experiences with different streaming platforms and events. Yeah. So there, here's our agenda. We're going to go through a little bit of what streaming services are, and then the panel will give presentations for each of these events. Um, NATC Taiko 10s will be discussed by Ben Pachter and Paul Sakamoto. Um, the Taikothon live stream uh, team, Sarah, Yudi, and Derek, will be presenting their experiences of broadcasting TCA's live streams. Uh, Man Man Moi and Amy Naylor will go through their Project Ikigai experience. And Michelle Fuji will talk about uh, Unit Sozo's recent concert that was uh, uh, held online. We'll also save some time at the end for Q&A and have some information about resources as well. Before we start, I wanted to just give a quick little plug to give you all some information about the Taiko Community Alliance. So for those of you that may not be familiar, TCA or the Taiko Community Alliance exists to empower the people and, ex and uh, and expand the art of, uh, <laughs> advance the art of Taiko. That's recorded. Uh, also, uh, in, relate, uh, in response to COVID-19 and its effect on the Taiko community, TCA has released some emergency funds. They created a plan um, that addresses uh, the impact that this has had on our community in three different ways. Uh, you'll see them up on your screen now, but first they're creating an emergency relief fund um, also opening up their hosted crowdfunding platforms and also uh, creating a fundraising directory for all of us to utilize as well. So there's more information on our website and social media about this, but wanted to give a quick plug for that. So let's start with what is streaming? Is it a brook of water? No, this is different. Um, it's streaming is basically a one to many audio or visual communications that's delivered digitally without the need for a download. So basically, it's the equivalent of uh, watching something um, on demand without having to download it. It's reliant on internet speed to deliver the content directly to you. This could be an audio book, this could be a podcast, this could be a, um, in our case, what we're talking about today is a, a, a live performance, but it's also in forms of Netflix and other types of things. So why is this important? Times have changed, as all of us are painfully aware of right now. Um, and also consumption of information has changed. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't have these little handy things right here, which are cell phones that exist in our pockets. Everybody now has a computer at the ready. And companies like Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, Amazon Prime, Facebook, etc., they've all changed the way that we experience media. Um, and really the ability for us to stream live events allows us to extend our reach. 
TCA is a great example of this. Starting in 2013, we tried to make the digital real and bring this community together more than just at NATC uh, by utilizing our uh, live stream platform and other types of uh, streaming media to uh, reach out to people um, beyond uh, an email. So use cases for these meetings, conferences, gaming, concerts, and live performances. Uh, but we're gonna go through some of those now. So what options really exist out there and what are they? Uh, as I was going through some of the research for this, there's a lot of streaming options out there. I think some questions to think through as you're planning these events are really to think about maximizing reach and minimizing complication. So really think through what your goal is with your event. What are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to reach the most users? Are you trying to create a resource for archive and later use? Is this a one-time event or is it gonna be ongoing? Um, also, where do your users spend the most time? Are, are you gonna try to reach people on Facebook? Because you better make sure that everybody has a Facebook account um, that you're trying to reach. Uh, also, what types of interaction do you wanna have with folks? Do you want to have an ongoing conversation or are you just sharing? Is it one-way or two-way communication? Um, Likewise, you want to consider what budget you have and what equipment you have at the ready and how easy it is to utilize those things and bring it all together. Um, with those considerations, we kind of created some buckets for you to look at different options for. We have your social streaming platforms. This would be your Facebook Live, Periscope, Twitch, Instagram TV, YouTube Live. There's a few that cross over different platforms, which I would probably put YouTube Live into event streaming as well. And sometimes even business streaming, depending on how you look at it. But social streaming platforms are really kind of like low barriers to entry. You know, this is, these are things that are usually free and the goal here is increasing reach. You see a lot of gamers utilizing these platforms. You see a lot of, um, a lot of vloggers that do live uh, streaming on Periscope and other types of things like that as well. Um, you also have event streaming, which is what we'll be covering today. Uh, Vimeo purchased live stream um, a few years ago, and that's a, a big player in this area. Um, we also have Dogcast, OBS, YouTube, and Switch. Uh, Twitch, sorry, <laughs> Switch is something else. Uh, but there's a bunch of different price ranges in this area, and this ha these tools are optimized to create entertaining and engaging content. Um, they can be complicated to utilize, much more production-centric. Uh, but they're great for events broadcasting and other types of things like that. There's also a business streaming category. Uh, so we're on Zoom webinar right now. This is what we're utilizing to stream to all of you. Uh, this is, I will say the price point here is a lot higher, uh, but it's, there are different uh, requirements at this level too, with different considerations. You see a lot of companies utilizing this for there are webinars, there are conferences, there's registration features associated with business streaming. It allows for, it's really optimized for talking heads and for presentations like this. Um, you also see here uh, the appearance of different options for, um, for enterprise SSO and security settings. Some of them are associated with content management systems um, with ability to immediately archive some of these uh, recordings. Uh, for later use and things like that. So the, this chart here, and we'll share the slides out after this presentation as well, um, are just some, some ways to kind of think through different groupings of, of what we'll cover today, different options of what exists out there. So here are some resources. I'm gonna say first and foremost, I am not an expert in this area. I have utilized live stream and have done some reading and some stuff on, um, on Zoom webinar. But I wanted to share out these resources where we got this information um, in case any of you wanted to do more research yourselves. As you'll see, these are mostly created by those companies. So uh, these are people that are familiar with the space and can give you a little bit more descriptions about what those features are. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to our lovely panel to discuss kind of their experiences uh, and what they what they uh, went through for their different events. So first up on the docket, we're gonna hear about um, NATC Tyco 10s with Ben and Paul. Take it away. 
Great, thanks, Elise. Um, I guess I am beginning. Uh, my name is Ben Pachter. I um, am from Dublin, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus. I'm with a group called uh, Dublin Tyco. Um, and my experience with streaming was via the NATC Tyco 10. I was the uh, photo and video documentation lead for 2017 and 2019 uh, NATCs. Um, and from the streaming perspective, I was most involved um, with uh, the, the 2017 uh, Tyco 10 uh, streaming and wow since we have the self intros on this on this stream uh, Paul do you want to introduce yourself before we switch slides uh, sure yeah um, my name is Paul I'm the director for Puna Taiko I'm currently serving on the TCA board as a co-secretary and yeah you know my my inauguration or what is it initiation to the TCA board was doing the live stream for the 2019 uh, NATC in Portland and that, that was a that's a very valuable uh, experience and we can talk more about that right after this and we get to see the full gamut of how much can change in two years um 2017 the whole idea and both of these actually came about through the fact that we had run into capacity limits for um an atc and we we're looking for ways to um to allow um, uh, Tyco 10 to be open to the broader community, since historically speaking, this event was something that was open to the public. And we weren't necessarily able to do that in 17 and 19 to the extent that we normally would like to be. So we decided to turn to the internet for that purpose. Um, and the portion before at least kind of talked about dealing with budget and available equipment and such. Um, with the 2017 Tyco 10, this is very much us uh, trying to do what we could with what we had. Um, and for all of us, it was the first time streaming an event live. Um, TCA to this point had done occasionally live streams through the Tycothon, which we're gonna talk about later, but this is the first attempt to have an event live. Uh, the idea that we had in our mind was to pr put you in a seat. So it's like um, you were there. So the perspective, um, the screenshot we have up on the left-hand side of the screen, this is actually what these, these stream look like. What we did, we set up a Logitech webcam on a tripod and just had it positioned in the audience. So this is what it would look like. And it was attached to a computer. And then from there we streamed to uh, YouTube. We had thought about various options that TCA had ac access to such as Facebook and live stream, um, uppercase live stream, not lowercase live stream. Um, and decided upon YouTube as the best way to disseminate to the most amount of people. Um, we learned very quickly that you know, you're limited by the technology that you have. If you put a Logitech webcam up, Logitech webcam is best for having a person a foot away from the screen, not necessarily a Tyco concert, um, you know, a couple hundred feet away. Uh, so what you see is again, what we got, it was not necessarily the clearest thing in the world. Uh, it was doable though. What was more complicated was the audio. Um, where, frankly put it, a, tyke, a webcam uh, um, microphone can't take Tyco. It just not, does not have the power. So it was, it was a very, it was problematic from um, a sound perspective. But nevertheless, we were live. We were available that anyone around the world could see Tyco 10. And that was as much our purpose as much as anything else. So to that, we succeeded. Um, we had a little more um, success whenever we live streamed Welcome Reception Jam, which was done through three different channels. We did the Post Tyco Jam, uh, Jam and such. So we, so we were able to experiment in different fashions, but we learned a lot, um, which is why whenever uh, 2019 came around and we decided we wanted to stream um, uh, Tyco 10 again, we were able to figure out what not to do and look to what we could do. And obviously a lot of technology has changed in terms of live streaming. So whenever Paul took on um, Tyco 10 streaming and everything else, uh, he put us into a whole different world and, and Paul can talk about that. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know, we were lucky. It occurred to me as I was going over my notes for this, we actually, um, in 2019, we ran a the TCA uh, fundraising committee. We did a quick crowdfunding campaign to, to fund the, the live stream for the for last year's conference and you know thanks to the community who everybody really came through we were able to um yeah seriously upgrade our equipment uh 2019 we bought uh three mevo cameras which are um pretty cool i was on the website before this and they have a new model coming out but we were able to buy three fairly decked out um bundles that we put together and those came in at around a thousand dollars each but um 
for the Taiko 10 anyway, we wanted to go with a multi-camera setup to give different angles and whatnot. Uh, luckily, we were already paying for the Livestream.com platform, which came with the Studio 6 switching software, which allowed for the live cutting as well as the spiffy graphics that you can see there on the slide. Um, that was all gravy. It was really, really nice to see all of that, that those uh, benefits and those features on that software. Um, as Ben had mentioned, we, you know, thanks to, actually, thanks to Ben's feedback, we tried to make sure we upgraded the audio capability also. So for Taiko 10, um, when it was working, we had a condenser mic right downstage, right in front of the stage. And that, it actually performed pretty, pretty great. Uh, if you look really closely, you can see that I had wrapped a tenugui around it just to add like a homemade muffler on it, just to kind of cut some of the, the high end and low end. And that, that worked great also. Um, we did have problems with the network for some reason. And to this day, I don't know what that was. We were patched in through uh, ethernet hardline. So I suspect it might've been um, security protocols at the school. Maybe we were burning up too much bandwidth because our cameras kept getting disconnected throughout the show. And um, since the microphone was patched in through a single camera, if that camera went offline, we lost the audio feed, which was really bad. But what was interestingly enough, um, at least for that one performance that you see on the screen there, um, one of the audience members downloaded her iPhone video. I guess she had videotaped the entire show from maybe 20 rows back. And her audio was like fantastic. I don't know what version, of iPhone she had, but it was um, really clear. And I'll, I, I don't know, I, that's something that I think we should try at the next conference maybe is using a backup iPhone audio because I guess they've upgraded considerably since 2017 because yeah, that audio was pretty impressive. Um, otherwise, just some lessons that we learned. The, the Mevos were quite great as standalones without the switching software. Uh, we did the closing ceremony, I think it was, with a single Mevo camera uh, streaming through a smartphone and that was super high quality um what else we had a fortuitously we had an off-site we had two off-site monitors one person downstairs watching the stream and another person over in atlanta i think holding a watch party and they were able to provide instant feedback like hey the audio is kind of soft can you bump it up and that that was a huge help because i thought i was smart and i brought my headphones with me but obviously in a ballroom with with taiko groups playing full blast you can't really monitor the sound even through headphones so that that was a huge uh, benefit and then um, lastly what I have there on the slide we also learned after the fact that when I was testing the stream I kept starting and stopping it and people who were signed up for live stream notifications were getting kind of aggros at us so if you're using the live stream platform be careful not to not to spam your users but yeah lots lots of experience lots of lessons learned and I'm looking forward to 2021, we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Ben and Paul. So next, we're gonna uh, have Manman and Amy talk to us about their project Ikigai. Actually, sorry, before they start, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. Uh, if you guys have questions for any of our panelists, please feel free to toss them into the Q&A tab that you should see at the bottom um, of your screen in the Zoom webinar panel there. Uh, so. Again, feel free to drop the questions in there. Sorry. Uh, but yes, next, uh, Project Ikigai with Man Man and Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, Hello. So I, my name is Man Man, and I am uh, I'm currently in Torrance, California, and I'm an independent artist that work in the community. Um, and I'm Amy Naila. Um, I'm also currently in Torrance. Um, but I'm uh, from Humber Taiko in, uh, in England, so I'm here, oh, I have been here for about a month, but I'm leaving to go home tomorrow. Um, and yeah. yeah. So we, we have a group, uh, an ensemble, a project called Project Ikigai, and originally we scheduled uh, to have a live concert at Asano Taiko um, on March 29th, but because of what's, hap what's been happening, we, we immediately shift that into a virtual concert instead. Um, so we, um, we actually live streamed our virtual concert through TCA, uh, their live stream account. Thank you, TCA, for offering that. Um, we ended up designed using the, the, that platform. It was actually initially inspired by Taikothon. 
uh, seeing what they've done and kind of adapt a similar format for our virtual concert. And all that actually came in two weeks with lots of changes throughout um, the, the plan. So in terms of um, hardware that we used, uh, we had uh, two of our MacBook Pros set up during the stream. Uh, we had one that we were streaming from and the other that we were using to check the stream and to check messages, but then that turned out to be too much in terms of bandwidth. So we switched to um, our phones for keeping in touch with people to make sure things were running properly. Um, we also used an external microphone, uh, uh, sorry, an external camera. Um, at first we were using the laptop camera, um, the webcam on there, but it was too much um, in terms of processing for the camera to, for the laptop to deal with um, and caused a lot of latency issues and stuff. Um, so luckily we had a camera set up that we could just switch to straight away and that seemed to fix all the problems. Um, it would have been nice to have an external microphone during the stream, which we didn't have um, because we could hear the sound of the calling fan all the way through the stream. But we weren't too fussed about that because we weren't picking up Tyco, like the same issue that um, you guys had before. Um, it was just the discussion stuff um, and everything else was videos that we were broadcasting. So that wasn't too much of an issue for us. Um, in terms of software, um, so we, so we had um, lots of videos, pre-recorded videos that we were broadcasting. So we had to create those uh, in advance. Um, so we used Final Cut Pro. Um, for the sound, we used Logic Pro. Um, and we also had a few other programs. We also used a little bit of GarageBand um, and iMovie. We also used uh, another member, a uh, member of uh, Manman's group, Mujo um, Parker. He used Adobe Premiere Pro on an iPad. Um, so there's loads of options. Um, available. And then for the stream itself, we used Livestream Studio, which is connected to the Livestream account. Um, initially, we were planning to use OBS, which is like an open source free software that you can use to stream anywhere, YouTube, Facebook. Um, but that doesn't actually link, you can't use um, other softwares apart from Livestream Studio, which you have to download for uh, the TCA Livestream account. So that's just something to keep in mind, which we figured out um, kind of last minute. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the contents of the virtual concert was um, we had 14 pre recorded videos broadcast. Um, so because we have to quickly adapt to what was changing every day, at the beginning, we could still gather in small group and record ourselves at the parks. Um, so we mainly use my uh, Zoom Q4 because I also have the what do you call it, the fluffy <laughs> windproof. Um, thing that to uh, block the wind noise. So it was it was decent recordings um, that we could we were able to use. But Zoom Q4, the downside is the visual quality is not as good. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time uh, for people that we ask to submit their videos, we just ask them to use phones. And some of our own recordings, the smartphone actually works even better than the Zoom Q4. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Zoom Q4 for Tyco, it works well because I can we can set the low cut um, so that works really well with Tyco recordings. Um, so uh, this uh, virtual concert turned into a global digital collaborations. We end up have uh, 45 participants from 10 different countries joining us. Um, so basically we just ask everybody, we, we send them a bass track or we just give them a set BPM and they all record themselves with, uh, at their home with whatever setup that they could come up with. Um, and then, so Amy, we all collect all the videos and edit the special version for the virtual concert and for the broadcast. Um, we, for the live element, live streaming elements, we have three live hosts, which including myself, Amy, and Shoji. Um, so we actually use the software, uh, uh, the live stream studio software to uh, invite Shoji as a guest to join us. Um, and. So Shoji was live with us mm -hmm. from his home uh, throughout the two hours event. And we interact with the audience through the comment, but unfortunately because of the bandwidth like was uh, fighting against, yeah, it was affecting our streaming. So we had to close uh, some of those and I could only occasionally check with my phone uh, to look at comments. Um, yeah. And for the pieces, we did mostly original pieces that composed by us. Uh, 
And also, Shoji also wrote something, and then we also have some adaptation of pieces based on existing compositions, for example, Chris's composition, which is open uh, copyleft. And then we also did an open source piece called Nakamono no Koe as like a women and taiko features. Um, we also had to make some adjustment because of the scenario that we cannot perform live and we're losing the interactive elements. So we had to adapt some of the pieces like which became special version only for this virtual concert. Yeah. And we asked people to improvise and if they have Taiko, that's great. If don't, they could use anything they can find. Some even just slap their own body or find a kitchen utensils to play with. So yeah, that's basically. Mm -hmm. So uh, lessons learned, I think it was mostly, everything in the run up to the live stream ran pretty smoothly. Um, but the actual live stream itself, we had quite a lot of uh, technical hitches um, initially. So it would have been really useful to, for us to have um, a rehearsal time with a smaller audience so that we could see how that would have worked. We had a tech run with me, Man Man and Shoji and everything was fine. Um, but then as soon as you bring an audience in, suddenly everything goes wrong. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind that would have been really useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um right at the beginning actually because mm -hmm. we thought at, at afterwards i was like well maybe we could have actually spend the first five to ten minutes actually like working with the live audience mm -hmm. because everyone is tuning in anyway um yeah so what was successful was um we kind of turned this difficult circumstance into a creative opportunity and we were able to include and reach many people uh during that two weeks as we were putting this together and many people actually really appreciate that um, as a way to like just <laughs> find find some groundedness um, and playing and be able to play with each other and connect with each other. We also did pretty well uh, supported like financially by the community, which we really, really thankful uh, for that. Uh, considering we both lost uh, most almost all our jobs uh, up until June, July, mm -hmm. uh, which Everything is still in the known. So we're really, really thankful for that. Um, and it's really helpful that we actually uh, kind of team up that like there are two of us uh, on camera. So I did most of the talking and Amy was like handling all the technical things at the same time. So that that was like a good uh, teamwork. Um, and also we also had friends to text us right away to let, let us know how we're doing, kind of like an offsite monitor. And then we also have friends commenting on this comments to tell people <laughs> that we are working on the technical issues because we couldn't, I forgot to log in to the TCA <laughs> account. I couldn't comment, which, yeah, lesson learned. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So best practices um, in terms of the, the run up to it, um, it was really good to have a clear aim for each of our videos so that we could have clear instructions to send out to the participants all in one place. Super easy for them to, uh, to do to work out. So we had a Google folder for submissions. We had a Google document with all the information in one place. Um, in terms of editing, um, it was good to edit the sound separately from the video. Um, just to make the process run a little bit smoother because when, when you've got loads of mobile audio to kind of try and figure out um, There's a lot to clean up um, So yeah sound and then video that was great um, Yeah, and appropriately crediting and mentioning everybody involved um, So we kept a running list of all the people that we'd contacted who we'd contacted where We'd contacted them and which one of us had been in touch with them just to make sure that we always touched base during the process um, and we checked everybody's names before we published them all. Uh, we screen. emailed everybody, even though it was a really short time. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and before you stream, before you start making videos, make sure that you have enough storage space on your laptop and then it's going to run smoothly because I ran into that issue so many times. Yeah, and things that we wish we would have known was, um, I, we didn't know that you can stream Google Hangout through live stream. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so now we know because we were like going back and forth with Shoji's face and ours. Um, mm. So thanks, Elise, for letting us know. <laughs> um, and best way to streamline our laptop desktop for Wi-Fi efficiency is actually to use um, the cable, mm. the Ethernet cable, which we actually have to set up, but we didn't think ahead of time. Um, and wish we could have more interactions with the audience. Um, that would have been like really great to actually have that elements involved more. 
yeah so that's basically yeah our project if you got a virtual concert and that's it thank you thank you okay thank you mon mon and amy and again if any of you have questions feel free to drop them into either the q a or the chat uh but next we'll talk with uh our Tychothon team. So this is Sarah, Yudi, and Derek. Take it away. Hi, I'm Sarah Gilbert. Um, I'm currently in New York, a um, member of Sodaiko, and I was involved in our most recent Tychothon this past year in 2019, which was um, Tycho Vision Dream Out Loud. My co-presenters want to take a moment and <laughs> introduce themselves as well. Uh, hi, I'm Yuri Kanamaru, and I currently teach at Los Angeles Taiko Institute at Asano Taiko US, and I also play with the LA Miyake Kai. And I was part of the Taiko Thon team on for 2015, 16, 17, and 18. Derek, I'm TCA board and keynote Taiko in Los Angeles, and I was in the plan. And volunteered in 1718. And I may have cut out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you both. Um, so, TCA has been hosting Taikothon since its inception in 2013. Um, and from that beginning time, we've been using the live stream platform. And you've heard it referenced now a couple of times through using it with Project Ikigai and using it um, for NATC. Um, so we started that with Taikothon back in 2013 and um, as far as why we chose that platform because even back then there are others to choose from live stream is kind of the powerhouse that came out of the live stream era um, there were a couple of reasons for us that we wanted to go through so one was continuity of content so as an organization that produces annual and biannual programs it made sense live stream has a, a great um, way of archiving and maintaining the footage that you've done in the past um, in this nice little colorful album um, so that you can go back and share those out again with other people you can go back and reference them it's great for folks to learn from if you're doing an annual or regular programming um, and just for sharing with friends or doing throwbacks now that we've been around for a long enough time um, another was control of formatting so because it is one of the more robust softwares um, it can be a bit of a learning curve but at the same time it gives you a lot more flexibility to really um, build up what you're doing. So one of those things would be the ability to transition between a live or pre-recorded videos. Um, you could use one or the other or both and also add slides and fancy it up as much as you want to. Um, you can control audio levels so it helps you with that and making sure that you um, are putting your best foot forward in how you're doing that. And so sometimes, you know, if you're using pre-recorded video and live video, the difference in those can be pretty large. And so this um, gives you a lot more control and visual ability to make sure that you're not all of a sudden blasting something incredibly loud at folks when you switch over to pre-recorded video, for example, so it helps with the viewer experience. Um, others can stream into your event, so through the producers app, um, you can let other people share, and also you can have co-hosts in remote locations, which you saw with Mon Mon and um, Amy and Shoji through Project Ikigai, so it's a pretty great thing for this particular period of time as well. Um, and then one other component to it was some of these events can go on for hours. The first Taikothon was a 24 hour event, which can be a lot of footage to scroll through if you share everything that happened in that. So live stream offers you the ability to take that event that you had um, and, and um, in that kind of little file that's saved in live stream, you can seg segment out different portions and label it so folks can more easily go and find particular things that they want to view. You can share those out with other people outside of live stream as well. Um, so it provides a lot of options for archiving and saving and sharing what you've done, which is great since I'm sure everybody will have put in a lot of effort to creating these events and so why not let them be experienced multiple times. Um, but live stream does have this component of being cost prohibitive for some because it is such a robust software and so a couple of other considerations um, in the beginning TCA had also considered Facebook live it was also partly used in um, 2017 before we ended up switching over to um, the current um, equipment and software that we're using after hosting the go live campaign in 2019 
Um, but that has its own limitations in terms of accessibility to people um, and the control that we have over it. So live stream ended up being a better option for us for various reasons. But also there's a program called OBS, which is Open Broadcaster System. Um, and in functionality, it actually is a lot like live stream, but it's free. So it's basically just a free open source um, video software that allows you to record so you can do live. It captures your screen. Um, so it records your video and your audio. So if you have a webcam and you have yourself on your screen, you can record it there. It's pretty popular with um, Twitch users, people streaming video games and things like that. Um, but then it also affords you the ability to section in um, pre-recorded video. So most recently, Sodaiko, we released our 40th anniversary um, footage through Facebook Live and we did end up streaming that through OBS because it was this free software that allowed us to stitch together our whole event um, pretty easily and share it out. And then because it's um, an open source software, they do have um, their API keys open, meaning that people can make additional software to use alongside it and enhance that experience. So there are some things like um, additional software you can use in conjunction with OBS that allow you then to take that stream and send it to multiple channels at one time. So I know that is a resource that some people are looking for a lot. So that's a great program to look for if you're looking for a cost effective solution um, and not needing maybe some of the more archival um, or professional level um, options that live stream does offer you. Um, so going more into hardware next, we can jump to the next slide. That's the software side of things. Um, okay. Hardware, um, we had a camera and it was a camera that Derek just bought somewhere. <laughs> it wasn't anything fancy. You can see in the second picture, it just kind of propped up there on a tripod. Um, and then something fancy came in, Nevo, which Sarah used uh, last year and she'll, she can talk about that after I go through the list. Uh, we had an HDMI cable, and I think Mamon talked about having an Ethernet cable was important. At one point, um, we did use a MiFi, the portable internet, um, because we didn't know if our connection wasn't going to be good enough. So we had that as a backup. We also had two computers, a broadcast computer, which uh, you can see in the first picture, Vivian's on her uh, laptop plus a monitor. So we were able to do... Um, use that as a as a tool the extra monitor was awesome for the broadcast producer we also had a streaming which in the second picture you can see um, there's laptops over there i had a um, noise canceling headphones on and i wasn't listening to anything that was going on live but i was watching the stream and telling them all oh, the audio's off or hey the video cut off hold on hold on and um, the broadcast monitor, uh, the, the producer was able to fix everything and right away, instead of waiting for like people to comment or text us that something was wrong. Um, let's see, yes, a tripod. We talked about using a mic, but we never actually ended up needing one. So for our situation, we didn't need a mic. Um, and I think Sarah can talk about how awesome Mevo is. Yeah, definitely. Um, I am. For anyone else like me, I'm completely camera, video camera illiterate. Um, so when it comes to trying to use higher quality um, videos for streaming or for recording anything, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and so the Mevo ended up being an excellent option for us because it is very compact. Um, it, they do have bundles of it that you can get the camera and an audio booster and the cabling that you need to make it successful, even a tripod in some situations. Um, and it works pretty seamlessly. It's produced with live stream, so it works seamlessly with that program for us. Um, and it also, our, my favorite thing personally is it comes with a companion app, which we had a lot of fun playing with because basically now you've got this live stream, you can pull it up on your phone so you can go walk around different locations and test things out. It allows you to like tap and zoom in and have these controls over how it's um, presenting the film. So during um, Taiko 10, a lot of the transitions that you may have seen happen. Um, some of them were Sue walking around with a cell phone and tapping and shifting things herself just as she roamed around the room, um, figuring out kind of what she wanted from the feed. So it's a uh, it's pretty great option if you're trying to go for cost effective and if you don't want to learn a lot about complex video equipment um, and if you're looking for something compact because the entire carrying case is about this big. And that's me. All right, on to the next slide. Um, Thanks. So, Taikothon um, 
the content is mostly pre-recorded videos uh, that we have that we've gathered from the community um, and team kind of collects goes out and reaches out and collects that media uh, so the first part of any Tychothon planning in terms of the content is really coming up with the theme so on the, the slide the various themes that we've had over the years um, and some of the fun wordplay that we've tried to in a couple of years um, we when we collected, we kind of broke down our media into different types of media. So we're segments. Um, segments are shorter clips linked to the event's theme, and anyone in the Tycho community could submit those. So this is for performances. So each person in volunteer uh, reached out to different people and collected performance videos, uh, which is the main bulk of um, a Tricothon. And then the last one was features, and that was solicited by volunteers uh, and linked to the theme and collected by the Tricothon crew. Uh, we also tried to have live performances and live um, segments. Uh, sometimes that was successful and sometimes that wasn't. Um, and again, one of the barriers was the audio. We did one year Tricothon where we had live Tyco performances, um, but just because we had the small camera <laughs> that I had purchased and uh, no audio equipment. It was a real big challenge to kind of balance the um, to balance the sound with that. So we could go to the next slide. Oh, that's me. Okay, successes and best practices. Um, the biggest thing for us was teamwork. There were anywhere from maybe a core four or five people. And then on the day of, there'll be a few more people. Um, everybody collaborated during the planning. So each of us reached out to different sets of groups and individuals for our videos. And on the day of, we split up the roles. So somebody was a broadcast producer and someone else was a stream monitor. Uh, the stream monitor also chatted uh, with the audience and took in comments and questions and also provided information about the group that was performing on, on the videos. We also had hosts and a very important, we had runners who would go get food for us or do um, just anything that we needed done so that we weren't scrambling for, for people to do things for us. Um, let's see, we want to make sure that the computer's updated prior to the event, which was something many of us have talked about. Uh, the timeline of events, we had a very organized like script and broadcast notes, time intervals and host notes that was very helpful, um, making sure that the program runs smoothly. Uh, oh, read guidelines for connection speeds. For a live stream, there's a little thing on the bottom that says how good your connection is. And as soon as it went to like bad, we realized that maybe somebody was on their cell phone and using the Wi-Fi connection or someone was using their laptop all of a sudden. So we wanna make sure that only the, the broadcast, uh, the computer and the stream computer was using the Wi-Fi. Uh, be mindful of lighting because it's hard for people to watch uh, videos or live streaming when it's really, really dark. Um, yeah, for long interval uh, events like Tycothon, make sure you have engaging content. We have prize draws, guest appearances, costume changes, like the first picture, and we had little Easter eggs, fun things for you to find. Uh, and the second picture here, of course, very important, food, snacks, and water available for everybody that's involved. And on to uh, best, sorry, lessons learned. Oh, that's me. <laughs> so the, the first thing that I think everybody here has talked about is update your computer. It is a rite of passage to host a live stream and have your computer update during it. But if you don't have to go through that, don't. Um, so basically doing a test run is a, a great way to make sure everything's going to work for you. So test out your computer memory, meaning that if things are slowing down, see if there are any programs open, see if you need to not use Wi-Fi, but actually connect through the ethernet. Um, and make sure you have the cabling to do that. Check your internet bandwidth, check your sound. So make sure that the mics that you're using are testing at appropriate levels. So that does include, as um, others have mentioned before too, maybe having somebody, if you do a test stream, um, Facebook, Live have, Facebook Live has the option for you, for example, to share um, something live and only share it with specific people. So when we did our test run, what we did is we created a live feed, um, but shared it kept it private and only shared it with select people so that they could watch the feed and let me know how the audio was coming through and what balance we should set it at um, and then test the transitions from live video to 
from live to video and video to live, because depending on what program you're using, it could be a little bit of a longer stretch. And sometimes that can be panic inducing when you are live. So it's good to have a feel for that. Um, internet and computer problems can result in low resolution streaming. So if you do have a bit of a slower computer or a slower bandwidth, just be prepared for that. And it is probably better to run it in a little bit of a lower resolution than to have it stopping and going. So it's a sacrifice you kind of, it's good to be prepared for ahead of time. Um, and then having multiple people or helpers assigned for different roles lets people rotate and switch out. So if you have somebody sitting there staring at the stream the whole time, they might need to use the restroom, they might need to take advantage of the snacks that you got, and it would be really sad to just sit there and watch everyone else eat the snacks. So make sure you kind of know who's doing what and how time intensive that is, and have people planned out and available to swap as needed. And I did not take this lesson at the beginning of this slide, but slow down your speaking and make sure to enunciate because sometimes you get very excited in a live event and you tend to just zoom through everything. Um, so chill <laughs> and just um, enjoy what you're doing. That is it for our slide. Thank you very much. And if you do have questions about Tychothon or Livestream or Mevo or OBS or any of these other resources, feel free to ask them. And we'll also share out resources like Elise had that page before. We'll add some more when we share out this video later. Thank you, Sarah, Yuri, and Derek. Um, and now uh, we'll go into our final uh, panelist presentation with Michelle. Uh, and she is going to be talking about Unit Sozo's performance of otherness togetherness. Yeah, um, so hi everyone. My name is Michelle Fuji. Um, I'm based in Portland, Oregon. I'm a free, I'm a professional taiko artist and I also um, co-direct a company called Unit Sozo um, with my partner and husband Toru Watanabe. Um, so I think that uh, this webinar has been really fantastic at giving you a lot of tips and many of the things that I might have technically um, been able to provide has already been spoken. Um, so I actually am going to just tell you a little personal journey of uh, sort of how we came to be into a live stream and how I came to be to represent this journey. Um, because because originally um, this show that was scheduled on the 21st, 22nd of March uh, was going to be a live performance. And um, that live performance is in relationship to a three-year artistic project uh, called The Constant State of Otherness, um, where we have been working as a company um, within cities throughout the United States, um, hearing stories about otherness, specifically on belonging, um, and home displacement and loneliness. And um, as we've been weaving this together, we've been trying to find opportunities to share out some of our work. Um, this particular show in March was going to be uh, hi uh, highlighting and featuring um, the folks and people that we've been collaborating with who were making our show. Um, Joe Kai, who is a Korean American uh, violinist sound looper who um, was is doing a sound design for constant state of otherness and when i say constant state of otherness that's all that was and that was it is um a theatrical uh, program that was going to tour may 2020 but at this point is de delayed um and so this in some ways was going to be a preview concert of some of the work that we had been collaborating um with these great artists um on Horatio Law um, is a Chinese American uh, artist, a uh, visual, in, visual ar artist who is doing installation work and also creating set design for our show. And so it wasn't just Tycho centric. Um, our show was going to represent um, collaboration with sound, um, visual installations, and of course our drumming, while also incorporating all the stories that we heard about otherness. So when we were um, faced with our date and things were changing because in the United States um, at that time, about uh, two weeks prior, things were just um, happening at uh, on a daily speed. 
um, it became pretty evident that uh, doing a live uh, performance wasn't going to be safe and we didn't want to put an audience into um, that position to make that choice. So we uh, also shifted but uh, to, to a live stream decision, but this was seven days before our show, <laughs> which is not a lot of time. Um, especially because we had practiced an entire live show um, right before that. And if you are in any sort of uh, performance art uh, that not through t watching on TV where it magically happens, these sorts of things uh, take a pretty long time to uh, process and practice through. And so we had to make some pretty swift decisions. Um, but the first uh, decision that we um, decided instead of just, oh, we're just going to do our, a live stream was why. And um, when we asked, why do we want to do this? Because another choice could have been to cancel our show. Um, there were things that were happening. And we can move to the next slide. So for us, um, you can see these are some of the headlines that were starting to happen exactly at the time in which we were creating the show. And um, with our topic of otherness, a lot of it is boxing in, stereotyping, um, creating places in which we distance ourselves because of fear. And these are the headlines that we were seeing um, in our communities and specifically when, um, for all of us representing a Pan-Asian um, cast, this was uh, something that was impacting a community that, that all of us represented. And so our why was that we saw all these xenophobic, racist, sort of, um, even, even if it's just small, fractal, tiny examples of people getting accosted or yelled out because of being Asian, we knew that we didn't want this to be the legacy of what the coronavirus era is going to be, that this is a time in which racism is okay. And so for us, we started to become committed to this particular topic that of course has been a three year journey. Um, it became even more prevalent, relevant for us to um, start bridging the ideas because right now we're talking about self isolation, separation, social distancing. All these are the words that we've been discussing about what otherness does. And so for us, it was important that we became some sort of catalyst, a reminder, um, a poker, um, to be a counter narrative to some of the ways in which our API community was being represented. So uh, the, the next thing that we did, um, and we'll go to the next slide, was um, we developed some values and assets. And, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the pictures and how it was set up a bit, but I wanted to spend some time here, um, partly because I feel like uh, being the last speaker, maybe I can talk about um, building a program um, and some of the things that you might want to think about. But I'll tell you our values and assets because we had to develop the show not only in the midst of this crisis when things were still forming, literally uh, things, were happening daily, mandates were starting, uh, the shelter in places just happened five days before our show. So it was like seven days before we decided to do a live stream, five days before there was a shelter in place, which decided that our, our unit Sozo Ensemble, which was based, uh, so three of them based in California, were not going to be able to fly up. So great, all of the artistic work that we had practiced is not going to be able to be done with the people that we thought were going to be with us. So how, what, and, and so there were a lot of hurdles that we were going through every single day. Um, but the values and assets that we decided to move forward with was um, to lean into our imperfections. We knew that this was not going to be the uh, perfect show. And we knew that we didn't have the time to do that. Um, we were going to be kind, generous, and open about our inadequacies. So we um, did a big asset building and of, of talking about each one of our skills and because we had to limit how many people could be in the room as well as how many people would um, be even available. Um, we knew that live streaming was not in our pocket at all. Um, we knew also because many um, organizations that would lend, for instance, better camera equipment, we were calling all around, they were all closed. 
for business. Um, and so we just started going, let's do collections of what we have um, and go alongside with um, not, for instance, the best, but um, with what, what is in right, right here and we'll do the best with what we have. Um, we were transparent and so in our program, we uh, did a lot of work in trying to share with the audience our journey of the things that we discovered that we couldn't bring into the room or things that were happening. Um, and we took every problem, hardship and hurdle as an opportunity to go towards it, not away. We weren't trying to fix our problems, we were actually trying to lean in. So, um, oh, and lastly before, and I'd love to go into some examples of that, but the last thing that I would just say in regards to some values and assets that we brought forward is that we, be we believed in time-based art. Um, and I, I say that because um, the, there's a reason in which I became a, a, a performance artist and, and the live experience of being able to do something with an audience versus um, sort of having something happen and then uh, sharing it afterwards. We wanted to be in the creative process with the audience and could we still do that? There were some unsuccessful things in our show for sure. Um, but our dedication was to, to have a very, the entire thing be completely live. So whatever happened, whatever problems were happening um, or occurred, we were doing that with everyone and we tried to make that um, potentially a team experience. And, and when you think about that, when you go and sit down to a show, that's actually the relationship that you um, are there to do. Whatever happens in the show, regardless of the content being practiced beforehand, um, that is the one moment where they're in the present. Um, so that created some really interesting um, <laughs> opportunities. For us, um, I'll say Unit Sozo does, we are a very movement-based um, taiko uh, focused group. Um, of course, the sound is incredibly important to us. We often talk about um, how our movement frames the sound. Um, but for us, especially we were collaborating with a visual artist, um, the um, opportunity to really pr provide multiple perspectives was um, definitely the framework. So we actually developed multiple sets in our um, space. And as you can see here um, in the, the top right picture, um, what we were setting up is one of our installations and a very specific angle that was really focused um, onto that place that would visually represent. Um, and you can also see um, that we had sort of like a master um, sort of like a monitor that was um, going between all these multiple screens. Some of them were laptops, laptop captures um, and some of them were just mobile devices. Um, so let's move on to the next screen. So these are some pictures from our show. Um, and some of the ways that this uh, played itself out. Um, when I was talking about leaning into the hardships, one of the things that we understood, um, it became uh, one of Joe, I will say Joe Kai, uh, decided that he needed to go into self-isolation three days before the show because he had an elder in his home and that became a new thing. So instead of that going, oh, no, you can't do the show, we figured out a way that we were going to still collaborate. Um, it limited our collaboration. But one of the things that we did was we did a live, um, uh, for instance, um, improvisational section in which Joe in his home and we in our space actually listened and improvised with the knowledge that there is a five second, five, three to five second delay between us hearing each other. But instead of making that a big deal, because we know we, we couldn't play with each other, we made that into something that became a part of the improvisation. Can we hear each other? What is that miscommunication that exists as part of um, this new interaction? 
Uh, we also did an introduction um, where it was uh, really important to have Joe be involved. And we knew that there would be sort of an interchange and a delay. But with that, we didn't, we weren't trying to hide any of that experience. We actually just let that happen. Um, some other things and hurdles that I, I just want to mention is, you know, some uh, conversation that I'd heard during the week before um, the show was someone was saying, I'm not going to go to Chinatown because they have signs that are in another language. And I was like, well, that's okay. You know, we no words for these things, but, um, the idea of, of us in the United States hearing other languages became and some, something that became part of our introduction because of that interaction. And so how do we then respond to become relevant? So with every single introduction that we did at the very, very beginning, it was translated into another, uh, another language of the languages that we could represent into the room. Um, one of the things that I had wanted to do was hold, and I guess I could have done like a um, like five minutes delay and just tune on after that. Um, but I wanted to give people the knowledge that from seven o'clock, we were aware that it was seven o'clock, but we were gonna purposely start at 7.05. Um, and I'm sure there could be some sort of thing on live stream that you could create, but to do some do-it-yourself sort of experiences where I actually created a little um, light box and put in my own kitchen timer and <laughs> let that be just part of this TV, like, like time-based art experience. So like get creative about how you want to represent. Don't necessarily look at technology um, as the way in which your uh, story could be told. Um, yeah, and I think for us, we definitely uh, focused a lot on our visual aspects. Um, I think some of the lessons learned and spoken about already is the challenge of um, Tycho and getting the right recording or um, sound devices. That's not something that was available to us. And so we just rolled with the punches. Um, we also made a big sound error in um, our last song, and that was creating an echo. It was something that we just didn't, we weren't aware of at the time. Um, and so that was one thing that was sad uh, for us, but also something to embrace. Um, and so for all the people that we could go to, um, we ended up sending a post sort of like video of the song that we had intended for it to be to people. Um, I just wanted to do a call out because um, a lot of the work and the journey that like I was sharing to you is, is some of the work that um, has been about otherness specifically in the United States. And I just want to say um, to y'all because we're in this era right now, this is going to be here and it's going to potentially last, um, dare I say, for a pretty long time. <laughs> And so I just want to point out a couple of things. One is that um, there is a documentation right now of um, sort of any racial um, or racist actions or xenophobic actions that are happening. And documentation is incredibly important. So even if it's uh, minute or you just witness something, um, this is a time to just write it down. Um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice is having a place in which you can put that um, into. And uh, don't think any particular experience is too small to record. Um, the other thing that I just wanna talk about too is that uh, recently there's the stark racial disparity of um, increased re risks of our black communities. Um, read about what's happening in Milwaukee and Wisconsin, Louisiana, Illinois, and specifically Chicago. And I just want to do a reach out because we don't want to be othering or doing more continual othering. And I'm using every single platform I can to, um, to, to ask us not to use the social distancing as an actual opportunity to continue distancing in all aspects of our lives. So, um, yeah. I, oh, I just want to also say, uh, too, because this is important, gratitude. Um, as Mon Mon explained, this uh, was an opportunity at a time in which we are looking as professional artists in 
sort of a financial funny place because we're projecting even for unit Sozo that for the next three months, everything has been unexpectedly canceled. Um, it was a great platform for us to just ask people to donate um, and to donate whatever they could. And that was a really uh, wonderful feature because of course um, my hope is anyone who did provide um, some financial support, it wasn't expected, but it was just asking if you were able. And it did actually provide for us some, some really nice support um, that came at a time that was important. Um, I also wanna thank Christy um, who was able to drive all the way up to be a uh, part of our cast and learn our stuff for three days. And I just say that because um, there just takes a, a tremendous amount in order to make these things happen. And um, Christy, you were a lifesaver. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and to all of our panelists. Um, we wanted to open up the floor now for any questions that any of you might have. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in to the um, Q&A box. Um, but simultaneously, I am going to deploy a quick poll. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to know about our resources. Um, I realize too that a lot of you are going to, you know, potentially be doing these streaming events for yourself. So you might see a poll appear up on your screen. Feel free to um, provide any responses that you that you feel like replying to. It's anonymous. Um, we want to understand kind of like what types of resources you guys might want to have, uh, relation with relation to planning online events or doing different types of streaming some of the information might not be usable until you're in the middle of planning um so some ideas were creating a facebook group some ideas i mean we're definitely going to share this recording maybe we'll do a little bit more research provide other uh, pieces of written documentation um, also welcome other ideas um, if you guys want to drop those into the chat as well um, this poll doesn't really have an option for an open-ended question, so I couldn't really add a space for you guys to put another idea on there. But if you want to uh, go ahead and add those to either the Q&A or to the chat, feel free. Um, so I'll give you guys just a, a couple more seconds to fill out the survey, and then we'll share the results. But in the meantime, if you think of any questions that you wanna ask our panelists, feel free. So we have, I think I shared the results. So it looks like a lot of people want to see uh, written resources and documentation for sure. A lot of interest in the recording of this session. Not quite as much in the Facebook group, glad we asked. Um, so we'll definitely uh, look into providing you guys uh, some written resources and documentation on the TCA website. Um, and in the meantime, I think we've received some questions. So the first one's coming from Kurt, specifically about audio. Tycho tends to overwhelm smaller mics, especially webcam and podcasting mics. What uh, audio has worked for you folks? Anyone on the panel want to take that? I'm going to type my answer in right here, just because I can copy and paste it over. I know um, on mine, you had mentioned also the fuzzy kind of like audio mic that you have. Uh, would you mind sharing some of that as well? Yes, I can. In fact, I'm going to grab it right now. Here's um, one we prepared earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so because I used uh, Q4, uh, Zoom Q4, and it actually has a function, uh, well, this is probably only for pre-recorded videos. Um, you can adjust the gain, like either manual or auto. So if I record loud drumming, I usually set it on low. There's also a low cut setting as well. This is the cheapest model. I know the more expensive one even have a compressor and more uh, things available for you to control the sound. Um, yeah, this is a pretty reasonable one. So the, <laughs> what do you call this? I call that a dead cat. Is that the right term? 
<laughs> so I call it a fluffy. I, I don't know why. Uh, I saw it when I used to work in the sound company. Um, and it comes with this, like when I bought this camera. So uh, for outdoor recording, like I just took this on and then <laughs> so it blocked all the wind noise. Um, and so it's really useful and handy. But the only downside is because we do a lot of uh, vocal singing and drumming at the same time. So for that setting, you have to do some work afterwards to bring up the vocal sound. Like I used this to record my, uh, my workshops and classes as well. The drumming, totally fine. But, um, but uh, with uh, talking, it's really low. I have to like have post-production to bring it, yeah, to bring it higher later on. So that's, that's what I use. I think I, I, I spent $180 for this camera. Wow. Thank you. And um, also Paul, Paul just responded to that question as well for Portland Tyco 10. Uh, they use Audio Technica AT 2020 Carteroid Condenser Microphone. <laughs> um, so you guys can take a look at that also in the Q&A box. Um, Joel has another question, um, and this one may be more directed at Derek. Uh, any plans for, the T for TCA to centralize a streaming platform or source for multiple Tyco groups to use, Tyco TV? Hmm. We, I think um, we, we just had our first pilot for sharing the live stream, and uh, we're kind of assessing how that went. Um, so there is there is no specific plan um for a specific like a centralized streaming platform um but we're open to hearing ideas um and i know paul has been collecting that information and if you're interested in um you know learning more about what tca has to offer with live stream specifically then just feel free to to reach out to um paul and myself and we can we can have a conversation and I just want to add to that as well. TCA has made our Zoom, a few channels on our Zoom account available. That's different than streaming. Um, Sarah and I actually had a webinar on that last week, uh, but it does allow for more kind of interactive events. And we have seen a lot of people in the Tyco community and other communities having gatherings on Zoom as well. So that is a resource that will be available to the community. Um, if you wanted to stream it, you could take the recording and throw it onto YouTube, although that's different. It's not really streaming, um, but that's also an option as well if you wanted to share. Um, if any of you have other questions that you have, feel free to reach out to us at info at tycocommunityalliance.org. You can also reach um, me at uh, my first name, Elise, at tycocommunityalliance.org as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, just to close out today's event, I wanted to share some kind of like best practices, uh, some themes that you might have heard throughout all of our presentations today. The first being do your homework and have a plan. You saw all, all of these uh, wonderful panelists. They have, you know, put a lot of thought into events, just like I'm sure a lot of you have, um, but also uh, doing some homework into the technical capabilities as well as key. Um, a lot of people mentioned scheduling a practice run through with the same conditions as your live event. So if you're planning um, an event at maybe 6.30 p.m. Um, on a weekday, you should probably test at 6.30 p.m. on a weekday. Some sort of uh, internet uh, bandwidth issues may occur if you test an event at midnight versus testing an event at 10 a.m. Um, that might look different. Um, have a backup plan for both hardware and software. Just speaking from, speaking from personal experience, if any of you were around for last week's webinar, live stream just straight up didn't work for us. So it might have helped for, you know, I, I for myself to have a backup uh, computer, uh, but Sarah had some quick thinking on her feet and created a Zoom session for us to meet as we had a backup software plan. Um, and you also heard a lot of people mention today having somebody monitor your stream your chat, uh, just you know, kind of having those champions of people out there to give you feedback live if there is an issue that you need to uh, address right away. Um, and the last thing you'll, that, again, all of our panelists also brought up is keep a level head, roll with the punches, realize that this is a new way of communicating for a lot of people and it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to, um, to, 
to not have it be 100% perfect. Because again, living in the moment, something that Michelle also stressed, um, you know, really trying to ha have the audience be part of your event as well um, in that way. So again, thank you to all of you who have joined in um, for our webinar today. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, and with that, thank you for attending. Yay. Uh, and we'll make the recording available for all of you as well. So thank you so much and we'll look forward to seeing you soon.